This is uh, Paul Schneiderman today on the 122nd edition of Sports Untold podcast, also on Rainier Avenue Radio. My special guest today is University of Washington football legend Joe Steele. Joe, I'll get back to you in a minute. My podcast is now on Spotify, YouTube, Amazon, Google, iTunes, Podbean. You can go to sportsuntoldpodcast.com. I encourage my listeners to click the like button regarding my show, comment, and you can go to sportsuntoldpodcast.com and check out my show on the website, other outlets. Um, I'm going to get back to you now, Joe. Joe Steele is a esteemed 1970s Husky football player. He's known as one of the greatest running backs in the history of the esteemed University of Washington football program. During Mr. Steele's college career, he set Husky records for most single season rushing yards, most career rushing yards, and most career touchdowns. Um, I believe, Joe, you were an all-conference team member three times in the old Pack 8. Do I have that right? You know, it's a little confusing because I've seen it a couple different ways. The reality of it is I was I was all packed 12 my uh, – excuse me, I was second team sophomore year, second team junior year, and all packed in my uh, my senior year. Well, thanks. that's that's how I that's how I understand it. I, okay. I, I I've seen the sophomore year that I was first team, but I don't think I was. Okay. Well, thank you for clarifying that. Uh, Joe is a Absolutely. prominent member of the famous University of Washington Husky Rose Bowl team that beat the uh, fourth ranked Michigan team in the January first, nineteen seventy eight Rose Bowl game. Joe was inducted in the uh, Husky Hall of Fame back in ninety six. Joe had a brief pro football stint with the Seahawks, the Canadian Football League. Uh, many believe that if Joe didn't have some injury issues, he could have had a long pro football career. Joe's been a successful um, professional in the commercial real estate field now for, for decades. And Joe, I shared this with you off the air. I communicate this to you that um, I'm in my early 50s. And one of my first initial introductions to the sport of football as a young kid was going to Husky games when I was six, seven, eight years old and watching you and Warren Moon. So you are literally one of my first introductions to football. And I think many people my age who grew up watching football in the Seattle area would say the same, that you are a, a pivotal person in, 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 in uh, introducing football to, to many people of my era. Um, Joe, I want to thank you for coming on the Sports Untold podcast, also on Rainier Avenue Radio. Absolutely. Nice to be here. Absolutely. Well, I got an initial question for you, uh, Joe, and this will be a light one. Um, Jim Shea is a longtime friend of mine. We were born the exact same day and year in 1970, and we're University of Washington friends. And um, Joe, or I'm sorry, Jim also wanted me to know this question is coming from Nancy Sherry. They were both class of 1984 at St. Luke's in the Richmond Beach area. And the question they have for you is, did Marilyn Sherry's 11-year-old daughter really beat you in pickleball when you were in college? <laughs> I'm sure she did. I'm sure she did. That's funny because we have a, first of all, that St. Luke's community is a wonderful community out in Shoreline. That's where we, we grew up. Um, I actually was born in Seattle, born in, um, born in Swedish Hospital and uh, in Seattle. And, and we lived in, in, the, in the Shoreline area for, I was born there. And uh, anyway, the Sherry's lived right next door to us and they had a pickleball court and they had the pool in the backyard. So it was really fun. And we got a very tight little community there. Absolutely. It's funny you said, Jim. Jim Shea just gave me the background of the close-knit neighborhood that you guys grew up in. Jim, Jim's my age, about 12 yeah. years younger than you, but he has a lot of memories of, of your family and so forth. So uh, that, that's my first question today, Joe. So, so uh, Well, it's interesting because St. Luke's School is about a block away. And I went to, we all went to school there. It was in a, the street that we lived on, a little street called Palatine. And it's kind of famous in that little community there just because of all the families that lived there. And we'd walk up to school and we'd walk home for, for lunch and we'd walk back up to school. And, and it was just a real, you know, really nice tight community. But one fact for you, I graduated from that school and Mr. Gaskin also, Miles Gaskin also graduated from St. Luke's grade school about 35 years apart, 36 years apart, but that's amazing. You know, I heard that somebody told me that back years later. And, the, and so a little tie in there for you. Two Husky football legends. I like it with the St. Louis connection. 
Jim, you know, you, you attended Blanchett High School, now Bishop Blanchett High School in Seattle. I went to Roosevelt. We were pretty big rival, rivals back in the 80s. And I want you to tell us about um, how you ended up at Blanchett and just about what developed your interest as a kid in the sport of football. It's obviously been a big part of your life. Yeah. Um, first of all, I, we, I, my family, I'm from a big family of eight kids. Uh, my dad was an FBI agent, government employee. My mom was a stay-at-home mom. Um, and my dad was transferred to Walla Walla. They always have an FBI agent in the city because, I don't know, probably because the pen's down there, but there's always an FBI agent in Walla Walla. So we, we got transferred down there as a, as a second grader. I moved to Walla Walla. Wonderful community, great place to grow up as a kid. Loved it. Eighth grade, I, you know, he gets transferred back to Seattle. Perfect. I would have gone to DeSales High School in Walla Walla, which is a 1A school. Uh, fortunately, I came back and, and uh, ended up in Seattle as an eighth grader. Played and turned out for football. There's no tackle football in Walla Walla. You played a little baseball and you played a little, a lot of basketball, maybe a little flag football, but no tackle football. So I, I decided I'm going to turn out for eighth grade and turn out for the little football team there locally. It was, yeah, it was, it was a feeder program for Shoreline High School when Shoreline was back in the old days. And so um, I showed up on the you know, practice the first day and they kind of said, well, what do you want to play? And I said, well, maybe a running back and defensive back. And, and they looked at me for a couple of minutes and they said, you're a tight end and you're an outside linebacker. And I said, okay. So I hung out there for a while for that year. And, and they, they kind of knew I was a St. Luke's kid and was I going to be a Shoreline kid or where was I going to be? It was kind of one of those questions. Anyway, so long story short, we went through the year. They figured I could run a little bit. They moved me to the wide receiver bit position a little bit. Great little quarterback back in the old days at Shoreline named Pete Lee like, that we ended up playing against each other as seniors. But and we became fraternity brothers at, at the University of Washington. But anyway, he, he ended up throwing me three or four touchdowns that year. And it was it was great. So. I go to Blanchette the next year. My sister went to Blanchette. And I, you know, it was kind of a community deal. All the St. Luke's kids, a lot of them went to Blanchette. So I ended up going to Blanchette. Comes around to football. I just said, I don't think so. Freshman year. I don't turn out for two days. So I get there the first day of school, and the freshman coach comes over to my locker and says, hey, come here for a second. And I said, so, well, what do you want? And he said, why are you not playing football? And I said, yeah, last year I didn't have a very good experience. And I just, I just really not that interested. He says, come, come see me after school. So I came and saw him after school. He says, you know, let's, let's figure this thing out. We'll make it wait. You're two weeks late. You're going to miss, miss a couple games. So he throws me as a wide receiver. I have a time of my life. It was a blast. And so fun times at Blanchette as a freshman, wide receiver, quarterback could throw the heck out of the football, which was great. So comes around a track season in, in my freshman year, and I'll make this short, but uh, I was running the 100, and varsity football coach Mickey Nash was at the track meet. He was up in Bellingham, actually. And so he, he comes in to me the next day in my locker and says, hey, come, come here for a second. So I want you to come see me after school. So he said, he said I go see him after school, and he says, uh, he said, I know you kind of like that wide receiver position, but you know what? I've been watching you, and I saw you run that track yesterday. He said, I think you're a tailback. And I said, no kidding. So I just kind of figured this wide receiver position out. Anyway, so he, uh, he ends up, so let's, let's figure it out. So two days come around my sophomore year, you know, and he basically says, you're, we're going to try you at tailback. So he throws me in there at tailback. 15 days turn, turns me into a tailback. We go out, played Kennedy High School in Memorial Stadium, um, you know, early 1974, I guess it was, and and I went off. We had a, you know, I had 300 plus yards, I had 220 rushing, I had 300 plus all purpose, you know, just did the game, just we went off. And so after after that game, um, it was interesting because uh, Jim Owens was the coach at the U at the time. And there was a, a guy in our team that might, that uh, the UW was looking at a little bit. Uh, John DeLu was a center, and he. Um, so the it was Tony Cope was was the Jim Blam writer, the recruiting this neighborhood at the time, and he comes in the locker room to meet John DeLu, and 
he said, hey, can I, can I introduce myself to this field kid? So he introduces himself to, to me uh, as, a, as a sophomore. And hell, I was 15 years old, I think, at the time. You know, so he said, you know, he says, hey, you want to come see the game tomorrow at Husky Stadium in the, in the, in the, the executive or the, the, the suite, you know, the press box? And I said, sure. Took that, took that home to my parents. And they said, okay. I went, went to my first press box event at the University of Washington uh, after my first game as a sophomore. But uh, anyway, in Blanchett was a ph- phenomenal experience, the right place, three classes, uh, this class before me in 75 had a ton of talent. Uh, my class had a ton of talent. And then the class after us had a ton of talent. We had five division one players wow. come out of those three classes, which wow. is pretty, you know, pr- pretty, pretty big number. Um, and that was basically Terry Sherwood, who was an offensive tackle, great player. Uh, Trip Rumberger, uh, who was a tight end. Barry Rifle, who went to Washington State. The rest of them all went to the UW. But Barry Rifle um, was a, went to Washington State. He was a center. And then Kenny Gardner, and I, you know, people locally know and hear the name Kenny Gardner, and they go, wow. I, I really mean this. I mean, Kenny Gardner, in my opinion, he, he was not only an offensive player, but he was also a really strong defensive player. I think he's probably, looking back on it, he's probably one of the best high school players I ever saw, saw play the game. He was, a, he was a year younger than I was. We played two years together at varsity, and he was just a phenomenal player. Great defensive player and great offense. I was an offensive player. That was it. I, mean, I played a little defense. They threw me out there once in a while just to make sure if they ran, somebody got by us that they could run, you know, run me down. But uh, I was the hit. I was a hit E. I was not a hit R. And that's that's how I lived my life as a as a football player. Really enjoyed, you know, that position and uh, the great experience at Blanchett. Phenomenal with great people around me. We ended up winning the state championship. My Junior year, and like I said before, that class of 75 was really strong. And then we ended up um, going on and uh, having a 25 year, excuse me, 25 game um, stint of not losing a game from sophomore year to uh, into my senior year. And that was, uh, at the time, that was really something. Those were early days. You know, 73 was the first state championship. Uh, that it was happening in the state of Washington. So it was, you know, just happening at that point in time. We actually won the second one. But interesting times, really fun. You know, Blanchett was phenomenal. Coaching staff was great. Uh, being that close to University of Washington, you know, we're three and a half miles away. Roosevelt, probably a little closer. Seattle Prep, probably a little closer, but pretty darn close, you know, to the University of Husky Stadium. So I spent a lot of time at Husky Stadium when I was in high school and Saw some games and actually invited me over a little bit during the summer to throw the ball around with them and all that other stuff. So it was good. You know, Joe, uh, I really appreciate sharing more about your your family background and your your times at Blanchett High School. And I think there's there's an interesting part of your story that, that I think we just learned about that as a freshman kid you were a little reluctant about football. And it it, it it's interesting that a what a good coach and some good mentors and good teachers can do to kind of get a kid to find a uh, you know, to find something that, that he or she, you know, is good at. So, well, I'll tell you, for, absolutely. And first of all, great leadership in Blanchett. But secondly, for Mickey Nash to watch me run the 100 yard dash as a freshman and to say, I think that kid's a tailback. And you're kind of going, really? <laughs> you know, so I mean, they, they laugh about that. And Mickey took that to his, to his, to his grave that he, uh, you know, he, he picked it out, you know, and, and so classic. Um, and they used to they used to they used to laugh about that. They used to make fun of the freshman coach, going, "Why did you have my wide receiver?" <laughs> so anyway, it was it was it was fun, and um, you know, some like I said, great leadership of Blanchett, but uh, wonderful experience, really was. Joe, by the way, if you see me looking towards the monitor here, it's to see if we get any questions from Facebook. So I don't want you to think that I'm ignoring if I if I glance over there. A little yeah, bit. absolutely. Um, yeah. You know, there's a famous game you were involved in, and it happened in 1975 when Blanchett played Garfield, I believe, in the Metro League Championship. And some local football historians say this may be the best football game, literally, 
in state history. You, you Gar, um, Blanchett beat Garfield in four overtimes. And one opponent on the Garfield team, uh, who later was a teammate of yours at the University of Washington, is the current Seattle Mayor Bruce Harrell. So there's a little there's a Bruce Harrell tie to this game. But why don't you just tell us about this famous 1975 game? Are there any videos of this game? Because I would love to have a chance to watch it if there are any. But you know, it's funny. I think we do have a video of that. Well, it's, it, there's no voice to it, but we've got some silent movies, but but uh, in black and white at the time. But you know, I, I think we do have some some video there of that. Um, you know, I'll tell you, one thing you got to remember is the time. You know, um, high school sports at the time was somewhat of a big deal in this city. And you know, there were the Sonics were in town, the Mariners were not, um, the Seahawks were not. There wasn't a lot to do on a Friday night. You know, people would come, they, they'd say high school sports was a big deal. Then when you wake up the next morning after a, 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 a game and, you know, you pull out the times and it gives you two or three, four pages of high school sports and you pulled out the PI and they do the same thing. You know, so it was a big following, um, some really good talent in the community. I mean, you know, um, I'll get to Garfield in a minute, but, you know, I'll tell you, you know, you had the, the inner lakes with Tom Flick and all the players that came out of inner lake in that year, John Edwards, and Chris O'Connor and Steve Pooler and many, many others that came out of, out of, out of inner lake shoreline and shorecrest shorecrest, probably the best team I ever played. It truly was. And they, they were, we ended up getting, you know, they, they had more talent than any other team I think that we, I ever played. And my senior year, um, we had quite an event with them. Interesting story. Um, you know, we were both scheduled to meet up with each other in Shoreline Stadium. And at the beginning of the week that people were going to, we were one in the state, they were two in the state. And um, the league says, you know what, Shoreline Stadium, what does it fit? 4,000 people, whatever it is. They said, nah, -uh. we're moving that downtown. So they moved and I'll, I'll guarantee you, you'll go back and look at the history and there's not many times, but high school sports was really big. Tacoma had some great schools. Um, they really did. I mean, Spokane had some great schools. Wenatchee, Wenatchee and that Lee Bofto and the experience they were had over there. I mean, so you had some really talented teams that, you know, and, and so we got, you go to, you fast forward, first of all, Blanchett and Prep used to play in the Western Conference, which was up north. They wouldn't let Blanchett and Prep in Metro. They, we went in my senior year. And so, um, and Metro was really strong. You know, we played in the North. Uh, Prep played in the South Gar with Garfield. Um, both teams were 8-0. Uh, we'd gone through the league. And, you know, we went through the league, but we went through tight. And we, we, were, we had some really close games. We almost got beat a couple times. We Ingram was our last game of the year. And, game was she was 28 27 and the guy missed an extra point early in the game or they would have beat us you know so it was one of those things where it was a very competitive football very good football um so we get in that game and you know we, i i heard about bruce harrell and he was you know first of all it, it wasn't just bruce and joe i mean there were 60 to 80 kids on their team and there were 60 to 80 kids on our team and they there was a lot of talent on both squads Interesting thing is, you showed up at that game, and it was packed. I mean, it, you couldn't get another body in Memorial Stadium at, the, at that night. It was unbelievable. And so we kind of, you know, pull into the stadium, going, "Wow!" And and this was game, you know, I mean, this is game nine of the year, and um, the game went, you know, kind of back and forth. Um, I said, I, you know, I kind of heard of, of Bruce and. And it, the talent, they had the Powell brothers, and they had Anthony Allen, who ended up coming over to you and playing with us, was a really good player, and played quite a bit at the U and went on to pros for a little bit. But um, Bruce was a man. I mean, he was a tough-looking dude. He had a big old afro going, and he had – and he, you know, so, I don't know, I think he had 30 tackles that night, and I think I carried the ball 36 times that night. And, uh, you know, we went back and forth. And, and we ended the game in a 14-14 tie. And back then, you know, they didn't play overtimes. It was before overtimes existed, but there was only one team that was going on to the 
state championship playoffs. So they had to go overtime. We actually played from the 10 yard in and we went for one, you know, and then we went to the second overtime and it was, you know, so it went to 21, 21, and then went to 28, 28, went to 35, 35. And then, and then they called, we were at a fourth down and, and uh, we went first, we had a fourth down and we, just, we did a halfback pass. <laughs> from about 10 yards out and on fourth down and threw it to a lifelong buddy of mine, Steve Williams, and he caught the ball and, and uh, Garfield came back and had to play their side of it. Um, and they ended up uh, in getting the penalty and not getting in the end zone. So we ended up winning the game 42, 35, but it, you know, it, it really was a special moment for a lot of people. It, you know, it really was, it was special for the city. And, and, you know, you, th you think about what 14,000 people in the stadium, you know, when you look at Garfield, probably had 1,500 kids, and Blanchett had 1,000 kids. And, you know, you say every every kid brings both parents. And so it's, you know, 7,500 people. Well, they're not going to bring both parents. And there's a lot of kids that don't go to the game. But anyway, there was a lot of people in that stadium that were really not affiliated with, you know, either one of the programs that were there, you know, to watch the event. And, you know, for, you know, high school sports, yeah, I mean, you know, but it was, it was pretty special. And then all these years later, you know, to, to see what's going on and gone on and where Bruce is today and all those stories is, is just a great story. But, I, you know, we hit, he hit me. I was the hitty many times that night. He, you know, I really was because he, uh, like I said, he probably had 30 tackles and I carried the ball 36 times. So, so uh, it was pretty, pretty amazing event. And, uh, and then we went on to the U, you know, U together and, it was interesting from there too. So I'll let you go ahead and ask the next question. Oh yeah, no, I love, love the history. And, and I, I read online, I think there were, there were estimated there were 13,000 people at Memorial stadium at that famous Blanchett Garfield game you're involved in. So that's a lot of, a lot of people at a high school football game, but incredible story. Yeah. And I, I Joe, I, I think that'd just be so neat if somehow or another, there could be a way to get that video of that game released. I think just so many people in the Seattle area of Washington state community would just love to, to watch that. So. Well, I'll, I'll, I've got a copy here. Let me see how I can get it to you. I'll get it. I'll get it to you. Oh, well, well absolutely. no, no, no demand. It would just be neat for, to, to be able to watch that. <laughs> now I've got it. And you know, it's interesting because one thing you, 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 I, I should, I should mention about that game. I mean, first of all, after that game was over, I'll never forget this. There was one of the guys on the Garfield team that said, Hey, some of the players would like to talk to you so you can see in this film where I'm going I'm off on the side with you know four or five of these kids from Garfield Bruce being one of them and they kind of said hey you know and the, and the other thing is um first of all Al Roberts was their coach Al was a really a great guy Al became my running back coach at the U uh, my sophomore year which still is a great tie Al was one of those coaches which just he was a great, great high school coach, great college coach, went on and coached in the pros for a while. Great guy. Um, he was, it, it's interesting just to take a step back. I mean, kind of the story, the way it goes is that, you know, he's the kind of guy that can really motivate those guys and make them better and make them play up and, and they, which he did. And so, but the year before that we were playing in the semi semi final football game of more uh, ever stadium against Wenatchee. And the story, the story goes, and it's in the paper, you can read it, but, you know, the story goes that Al came out of that game and he had Bruce with him and Anthony Al and the Powell brothers, and there was a car with six, seven kids in it, you know, and he, he said, guys, that's who we're playing next, you know, after we beat them, he was driving back home. He said, that's the team we're playing next year for the, for the, for the city championship, for the Metro championship. You know, he said that a year in advance. So, um, but Al, after they lost that game, Blanchett always had an assembly before football games, you know, kind of a raw, raw thing. It was really great. So the next week and after we ended up losing that, we played Sammamish for the quarterfinals or whatever it was. And it's actually the semifinals, I think it was quarterfinals. Anyway, Bruce and Al and a couple of the other kids from Garfield, they came over to our assembly and they stood up in front of the, the, the deal and spoke to us. And it was unbelievable. Very classy, very neat, very neat. I like the Al Roberts connection. Yeah. 
You know, you made a yeah. major decision in your life, Joe, back in about 1976 or so. You were recruited by many schools, including Notre Dame. Um, tell us about your decision to, att- to play football at the University of Washington, attend you know, college there. But here's another question I have, Joe. Do you ever wonder what would have happened to your career in life if you decided to go to Notre Dame? Um, well, let's start with the start of that question. So first of all, um, Jim Owens had just left. Don James had just come in. Um, and I had a lot of chance to go to school in a lot of different places. Um, I actually took a recruiting trip to Oregon State because Tony Cope, who used to coach at the University of Washington under Jim Owens, I mentioned earlier, uh, he was now working under Craig Furtick at uh, at Oregon State. And Kenny Gardner's older brother, Chuck Gardner, was a wide receiver for Oregon State. So I went down to, the, to Oregon State as a at, on a on a trip and actually it was a heck of an event because at the same time UCLA was in town that weekend and UCLA ends up getting beat by Lonnie Shelton and the Oregon State basketball team and it was just a great weekend but anyway that's another story but um, so Don had come visit Don and Jim Lambright Jim was the he was the uh, recruiter for the Puget Sound area and Jim and I started to get to know each other our sophomore year, my uh, junior year, because Jim and Jim Owens had left. And uh, and so he and Don came and visited my family one day, you know, after my, it must be my sophomore year. He had just come in. And so he, uh, we visited then, and I got to know Jim really well and really liked Jim Lambright. And got to know Don a little bit at the time, but not much. I mean, he didn't say much. He talked to my dad a little bit, talked to my mom, and you know. But he was at the house, and you know. And it's interesting because Jim and Don did a great job. They really matched up well together. Don was the guy that checked you out. He was looking at you. He was looking at your maturity. He was looking at your, you know, do I like this kid? He's looking at you know how you carry yourself, all those things. Jim was doing most of the talking, and it was just kind of the way the way it was. Um, I took a trip to Nebraska and I was due to, you know, Stanford was in the mix and Cal was in the mix. And, you know, there was, there were others, including Notre Dame and Oklahoma and Colorado. And, you know, and I still have you know, bags full of old stuff that was college related that my mom always kept everything she ever, it was great about that. So I got a, a big bag of stuff and my college days, but she, uh, or college recruiting days and all the all the letters from all the different schools and you know so I took that trip back to Nebraska and I left the, I had a basketball game that night I left you know I got to the airport about midnight and got back into got back into Omaha about four in the morning and got to Lincoln about six in the morning and had a meeting with Coach Osborne back there and they were really a powerhouse program at the time and and so. You know, I um, I didn't have anything to, you know, it was so far from home and I there was no ties to me whatsoever. And I was just a number, you know, and, and it, nice, they matched me up with some kid from California, which was great. And I, he was my host for the weekend. And, and I had a nice, nice time. It was a beautiful place, beautiful stadium, nice little town, good college town. But, you know, and I, I just, you get to the point where you're just getting tired of the whole thing. And, you know, the other thing is, I, I was from a big family, you know, and I, this is my home and I got a beautiful school three and a half miles from where I go to high school. And, you know, uh, you know, so I come back and I said to my basketball coach or that you know, basketball coach at the time was a guy named Ed Olson, who was also really into football. And he, he was a former university of Washington football player. And he knew Jim, Jim Lambright a little bit. So he, you know, I said, I said, Ed, I'm done. I'm no more. I'm going to the University of Washington. And so uh, he picked up the phone call. Jim and Jim was over at school shortly thereafter. Trip Romberger, who was, uh, he committed the same day. And you know, we committed probably a month and a half before uh, signing day. But you know, the thing is, um, 
I mean, the city of Seattle was really trying, you know, it was developing itself a little bit. And at the time it was just, and, you know, to, to have, you know, a couple of kids like Tripp and I show up and say, Hey, we're in, you know, and all of a sudden you have Flick say I'm in and you have others say they're in, you know, and the kids from Shorecrest, I mentioned earlier, uh, Vern Olson and Mike Curtis were a couple of players out of Shore, Shorecrest. And, you know, you just had a, a lot of talent from the different schools. I mean, uh, the kids from Spokane, you know, and so, you know, committing and committing a little bit early, all, a lot of those other players, Brett Galliardi is another one out of Glacier down, down in South End. Um, you know, they end up committing. And so, um, and Don referenced that later, you know, in, in his, in one of his stories that, you know, that, um, that, that, you know, when we decided to make that early decision, um, it, it, it did impact recruiting a little bit. Now, the one which was a tough one was Bruce. And Bruce had, you know, Bruce's sharp, sharp kid at the time. And he was, he had an opportunity to go to Harvard. And boy, he had an opportunity to go to Harvard and, you know, probably play football, but really there for the books. And he was a smart young man. He was four point student his whole, whole time through. And then, or he goes to the University of Washington, plays a little football and, you know, goes to school, you know, that Harvard back and forth. And I think Bruce actually said, hey, I'm going to Washington. And then Harvard really put the squeeze on him. It really put the squeeze on him. And then it kind of came down to it. And he was kind of going back and forth. And I think he finally just said, hey, I'm going to go to the University of Washington. And, uh, you know, so that was, that was, a, a, I'm glad that that happened. But that tells a great story about, and Bruce is a sharp guy, sharp, sharp guy back then, real leader and good person and bright, real capable. But that Harvard story is pretty amazing. Harvard wasn't asking me to come on back. <laughs> I'm they never recruited me either, uh, Joe. So, you know. <laughs> Um, well, what great, I, I love that some of the background, this is much more, you're sharing so much more than what you read in some of the short publications about you and your career and the Huskies that era, you know, Don James was your coach. And I, I know you were very fond of, of Don James and, and a, a Seattle times article back in 2018, I read about you that it, it's mentioned that some, uh, local football historians believe that your commitment to play football that you dub, you know, also helped. Uh, Don James's legacy. Joe, when you were a young guy getting recruited by Don James, did you think at all back then that he'd be considered such a football coaching legend many decades later? Was that ever in your mind? Like this guy is going to be just a real legendary coach one day. I mean, first of all, I saw him at the house a couple times, you know, and I, I liked his style. I really did. I liked I liked his, you know, he's, he's watching, you know, he was, he was taking it all in. He was trying to figure out all the angles and how all this stuff worked. He showed up, showed up at the U and, you know, you got to realize something. He was, he was out of Kent state. He'd been a cup coach for a couple of years, I think at Kent state, but he was developing his, his program. I mean, he was developing his way about him. He was developing his leadership style. He was developing his, I mean, the tower came in during that period of time, you know, and him coaching out of the tower and, and, um, you know, the, the, the Thursday stories, the Thursday speeches, you know, his, his week and how it worked, his coaching, him coaching the coaches and the coaching coaches, a coach, they coached us, you know, all those, all those mantras, you know, his leadership, who he was. I mean, I, I, I'll tell you, they, they talk about him sleeping in the office. I, I, I think it's, I know it's true, wow. you know, so he was, he was pretty dedicated to figuring out the deal. And, and it's, it was, uh, it was pretty amazing to watch. So the, the question you asked is, was he special? He was very special. And the way he, you know, the way he, he led, you know, just a little thing, you know, I mean, one day along the way, you know, he's up in front of the players and he says, he says, um, you know, everybody in on this program is is really the same. The starting quarterback is very important to us, but you know, those guys taping ankles and walk in the in the in the training room, you know, those guys are very important. And those people serving food down at the mess hall, you know, those people are very important. 
You know, so he, it was really, and, and not only did he say it, he, he, he meant it. I mean, there was nobody, and he treated everybody the way, well, you know what you're doing there? You're developing a team. I mean, you're bringing something together. And, and just, I mean, you go through story after story, you know, be respectful, you know, be respectful to others, you know, be on time, you know, never be late. If you're late, it, it's not going to work around here. You're going to be out of here quick. And so, I mean, it was, it was, and it was a mixture of, you know, care, but it was also a mixture of just flat out discipline. And we're building something here. And you guys want to be on this thing? Jump on board. If you don't get the hell out of here. And he was, he was, he was very, it was, it was, it was really impressive. It really was. I mean, I know you say, you hear that and you say that and he's written, you, know, you hear the stories and the books and all that, but he, you know, and, and the, the people that he was around, I mean, you know, the, I mean, I had, I had two great high school, or two great coaches in there. Um, uh, Al Roberts came in. Ray, first of all, Ray Jackson was there my freshman year. Ray was a former Husky, played running back back in the 60s and played in the Rose Bowl, I think. And, and you know, I, I, so Ray, when I signed over there, he took, calls me up one day and says, hey, I'd like you to come over here. and I'd like you to spring during the spring. I'd like you to learn the offense. I'm going to take you in that film room and we're going to spend time at it. He was an X's and O's kind of guy. He, we lived together for three or four or five months. And, you know, and he took me in there and he, he taught me the whole darn offense. So I came in there in the fall and it was great. And he was a phenomenal man. I heard he just passed away. A great, great dude, really nice man. And, and so uh, he decided to step away from the program at the time they brought Al Roberts in and Al were, I were together. I was, he was good as an old guy, but he was much more of a, he was a motivator. He took guys and made them better. He got more out of them. And he was really, you know, you know, the interesting thing is you don't realize two things when you're sitting on the outside of that, you know, you have a, you have a position room and it's run, We were then running in the running back room and it was strong. It was fun. You know, you had Robin Earl and, you know, Ron Gibson and Tucson Tyler and Ronnie Rowland and Vince Colby and Kyle Stevens and, you know, and, you know, and, and, and Al was in there with us, you know, and, and he was, he was, he, it was a joy. The second piece of that is the locker room. And you people don't realize you show up and I know it's probably a little different, a little lot more space to it than they have. They, we didn't have that, you know, like the fancy schmancy stuff they got today. <laughs> but, but uh, you know, the locker room, man, you got to learn it. You got to learn how you fit in. You got to learn where, how it all works. Uh, you, you know, you, you, as a freshman, you go in there and you get your, you keep quiet, you know, you learn your, you learn your spot and you earn your spot and you, you roll through it. And some, some people understood that and some didn't, you know, and, uh, but it was a life. It was, it was the best life experience that I've ever had is walking in that university, locker, Washington locker. It was just, you know, to, to experience what you experience and see people from all worlds, all places, you know, um, and just to, you're, you're there. I mean, you know, you're there. The concept of not being late for a meeting. I mean, you had a three o'clock meeting and you had to get taped beforehand. You got down there at one thirty, and you weren't going to be late, you know? So, um, so you're in that locker room a lot and you're around these people and, you know, and you know, if you don't, you know, you don't hear the backstory on that, uh, that much, but it's a bit huge deal. It really was. But back to Don for just a moment, he co he brought some great coaches in. I mean, he really did. Jim Moore, really cool dude he really was a great leader um he led the defense dick sesniak was offensive coordinator tough old polish guy um just really tough gotta just you know some of those meetings where he would just be just you know he they wanted to win they wanted to succeed they really did um but some really great players one of my favorite coaches in my experience at university of washington was ray door he was the quarterback coach and, you know, he was an unbelievable coach. He coached, he had some great success, you know, starting with Warren Moon. But then he led that program for a lot of years. And he was a wonderful guy. He passed away many, you know, 10, 20 years ago of, AL, of uh, ALS. And so a little sad story. But he was, he was had a really a great demeanor, great person. Just, you know, you learn to be around that and you love them. You know, you, you don't really enjoy the people you're around. So 
some great people. Gary Pinkle was another one. Um, he went on to coach at Missouri and had a great, great success. Um, we just had some great coaches that I really, really admired. Um, so it was really a great experience at the University of Washington. And Don brought that around. You know, he really did. He handpicked a lot of those guys. And, and um, you know, at the time, I'll tell you, you know, it was interesting for him because they were kind of rough on him. They really were. You know, the press here locally was rough on Don. Um, his first year, you know, he went six and five. You know, the second year, which was my freshman year, we went five and six. I think it was his only losing season. And so kind of an interesting deal. This, the, the you know, it's, they were, the press was going, you know, Don, what's, what, you know, how are you going to turn this around? How are you going to build this thing? Well, the next year, we went seven and four. We went one and three to start the year out. Lost two really tough games, one in Minnesota and one in on last second field goals and one in Syracuse on last second field goals. And we end up one in one in three. And we end up rolling through the pack eight at the time and and ended up at USC beat UCLA in a late late game and we end up in the Rose Bowl sophomore year. So his third year, which is unbelievable. They kind of backed off the press a little bit after after landing that Rose Bowl. I mean, and he deserved it. He was, you know, he really did. It's happy for him and the coaches and the in the program. It really was, you know. Joe, so, you know, I it, it's interesting you mentioned Coach James. He was a strong believer in punctuality, being on time. I, I've almost every guest I've interviewed, Greg Lewis, Skip Hall, yourself, mentioned how big Don James was on being on time. So you, it, it, that's a, a common theme I get from all, everyone who ever worked or played under Don James. So you're, you're one of many former Huskies who's mentioned that about James. So. Well, I'll tell you something, you know, I mean, one thing, one thing that, you know, that happens is you go through something like that and you're around that. And, you know, those are your development years, you know, 18 to 22 years old. And, you know, you carry those things into your life and you carry them into business. You know, and I can't tell you how many times that something I'm doing in business, you know, is something related to what I came out of, you know, my younger years in sports. I mean, it was, you know, and that's a big one. You know, I'll tell you, if I'm dialing into a Zoom meeting at, you know, 1030 when you want me there, if I'm not there a couple minutes early, I'm dialing in late. That's not very respectful to you. And so. Likewise. You know, you really learn, learn from those things. And, you know, and, and time is, was always a big one for him. He, you know, I mean, the stories were, if you miss, if you're late for the bus, well, so sorry, catch a ride to the game in Oregon or in Minnesota, I mean, you know, figure it out yourself. I mean, it was, it was, I mean, I'm being a little bit facetious there, but it was, he was very, that was very important. And, and, you know, all those, you know, those, you know, being respectful to others, you know, the team concept and everybody's important, you know, all those things. I mean, they're, they're, you know, he, he lived them and he, you know, those were really important things to him and time was the time where issue was really important. Amazing man, Don James. Um, Joe, you mentioned Warren Moon and there's a something about Warren Moon's life and career that, that connects to your, your career was who I just want to ask you about is, and I can't speak for Warren, but I've read some accounts that, there was some discomfort he had during those years. I believe he was the first University of Washington African-American quarterback, or I may not have the history down perfectly, one of the first college black quarterbacks, I think around the country. And I think the first major University of Washington black quarterback. And I think Warren Moon felt some discrimination at the time. Um, did most of the players overwhelmingly support Warren? Just share a little bit about that episode at the University of Washington, Warren being the first black uh, major quarterback at UW. Um, you know, Warren came up here from California as a sophomore. That was my senior year in high school. And Warren won the job and, and he actually unseated, uh, Chris Rowland, who was a former Blanchett kid. And, uh, I think Chris was a senior and Warren was a sophomore. And I think James at the time was, you know, looking to develop the program and made the decision to go with Warren. Um, you know, like I said earlier, the, the press and the people, the alumni and the supporters, they were a little rough on Don. You know, they wanted to see some success. And 
I think the issue with Warren, you know, was, I mean, Don, he, he, he'll say that he never saw color. He didn't, you know, he was black and white issues were, I mean, he was going to put the best damn team on the field that he, he could figure out. I mean, we had Warren at quarterback and Robin Earl at tail at, at fullback and Ronnie Rowland at tailback for a while. And then I came in with Ronnie and we split time a little bit. And so, you know, it, it was, but, you know, Warren had some challenges and he'd probably tell you that at the same time. I mean, there were some moments where, you know, he, he, he you know, he made some mistakes. And it's, I mean, as a sophomore JC transfer coming into the University of Washington, that stadium with the, you know, it's, it's not easy and you're developing you over time, you know? So um, I'll tell you, when I walked in that huddle as an 18 year old kid and I was standing there listening to Warren and, you know, he calls your number and you're kind of going, Whoa, you know, and, and that, it was really an interesting experience as a freshman to get as much playing time as I did, which was fun, but total respect. You know, I, I mean, the respect level that I had for, for a lot of those people, but you're just, you know, I was just a little kid. <laughs> I was just a little kid in this huddle. How the hell did I get here? <laughs> you know? So it was really kind of, kind of funny how it worked but then to go on for just a step further I mean Warren and his development and his senior year was unbelievable I mean he you know in in the way that that year developed you know um and then to see what happened you know was really special and to see him in the Rose Bowl and to see him get the MVP of the Rose Bowl you know was really exciting you know and so you know, some of that other stuff, I mean, I, 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 don't, I don't know. I mean, I can understand there's a possibility that people were kind of rough on him and it wasn't, maybe it was because he was just the first black coach or quarterback, excuse me. But um, I don't know. I, I just, I think that, you know, I think that part of it was, you know, he, he was, he developed and he developed into a fine quarterback. And, you know, it was, it was so fun to watch and so fun to be part of and be in that huddle with, with such a great leader. I mean, he, he was a great leader, you know, and he, there were moments where he just, he'd say something or look at you and just kind of give you that leadership moment of his, you know, and like I said, as a young kid, that was really, that was really something special to be around that, that sophomore year of mine, that role, that senior year of his and that Rose Bowl was silly how, how cool that was. It was just that amazing. Love learning more about the history of that whole War and Moon situation, just from someone firsthand, such as yourself, that was playing with him. Um, Joe, you, you, we, we've talked a little bit about that famous Washington victory over Michigan in the January 1st, 78 Rose Bowl game. Again, one of my first introductions to football was that game. Great 27-20 win for Washington. Was that your favorite college football game? Um. First of all, it was January second. It was I'm a sorry. Sunday. They don't play. They don't play Rose Bowls on the on the on the on the first when it's a Sunday. Okay. At least in the old days they did. So anyway, I'm, I'm teasing you, but but uh, <laughs> but um, you know that's a special place, and it, Washington was cranked up, and you know we were big underdogs. Uh, was it the my favorite game? Probably it really was my, the problem I had was well, not the problem I had was I, I ended up getting a hit pointer about the fifth play of the game, uh, which is a shot helmet to the hip and pretty tough shot. And so I was uh, not play didn't play a lot in the first half, played a lot in the third quarter and, and played a little bit in the fourth quarter. Um, so I was only, car- I think I carried 13 times and had 75 ish yards rougher. Um, but most of that was all in the third quarter. So it wasn't my favorite game. I, I probably would pick a couple others as far as, you know, length of time in the game. Uh, but I, I really, it was so special to be part of that. And then to, you know, to go in there as I think we were 15 point underdogs. And I don't know if they had spreads back in the end of those days, but they, you know, they sure were favorite and we were sure the underdog and they you know everybody knew it and they didn't give us much of a shot you know to go into that and just and once again the level the the coaches the preparation that we went into that game with and you know taking a team like michigan and and make them crazy 
I mean, we, you know, we did, we did reverses. We did, you know, fake punts. We did this, we did that. We, you know, and it was, it was pretty amazing what had happened that day and what the outcome really was. And, you know, from both an offense perspective and a defense perspective, absolutely. Really uh, cool. Great. Just got a nice uh, on Facebook. Juan Cotto was very enjoying your interview. Juan is a uh, neighbor of mine. He played uh, baseball all day. And I think he mentioned that he almost went to Blanchette because of you. There's you and I think Juan have a, have a tie. And he referred to you as a UW great and player we all admired. Um, Joe, I, something else I want to ask about Warren Moon, and we'll move on from, from Warren. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to package Hugh McElhaney in this, century, in, in this question. So two of the most famous University of Washington players who are both in the Football Hall of Fame in Canton are McElhaney and Warren Moon. They were both JC transfers when they came to University of Washington. What's your take on this whole uh, transfer portal situation going on these days? Um, I have a lot of issues with a lot of what's going on right now. I mean, I'm concerned. I really am. Um, I love what my experience was 40 years ago. Um, I'm not an expert in any of this stuff. I'm a fan today. I really am. Um, but there is so much going on. that's really concerning and very different than what, what I grew up with. Um, we truly lived in a, in a, in an era of amateurism where, you know, you go to the school you decide to go to and, you know, you become part of the school and part of the community and part of the fraternity, whatever that is, you know, and you're part of this place. And the concept of the transfer portal is, is very concerning to me in that, you know, people could just get, get up and move from school to school. You know, I'm hearing, hearing about rumors about people recruiting in the portal which is just garbage, um, you know, so I'm, I'm really, you know, I, I don't, I don't like what I see there. Um, you know, it's really develop, the development of a team, but also those, all those, you know, things I talked about earlier, you know, the, the, the building of a person, you know, and how do you build a person when, you know, you don't have a team, you know, and all those experiences we dealt with with James and, and the other coaches, I mean, you know, it's just, it's just not, it's not what it should be. And I, you know, the NIL, I, I'm not a big fan. Um, I just think that, you know, I just, and the, you know, the concern about the, the leagues and what's going on here and, you know, in the, you know, and I'll tell you something, the sad thing is, and I, I don't want to get too deep into this because you don't okay. want me to get no, too deep do. into it, but, but I, but I really, I, I just think that it's, it's, it's dangerous for the sport, for the sport that I, I love. I love to wake up on a Saturday morning. If the Huskies are in town, great. If they're not in town, I'll sit down and watch a nine o'clock game and I'll watch a 1230 game and I'll watch a four o'clock game and I'll watch a seven o'clock game. And, you know, I, and I enjoy the heck out of it. I, you know, I, so I, it, I really, it, the game is really, it's beautiful. And it, it's, it's the way that, you know, that we kind of grew up with it. And I'm cons so much of the game today is about, you know, the money, it's so much about the money and, you know, it's just not necessary anywhere. I mean, you know, it's just, it's just, it's just bad, you know, in the poor transfer portal and the NIL money, you know, the coaches and what they make Does Nick Saban really need to make 12 million bucks a year. He doesn't, you know, take that money. I mean, these are, you know, and they, you know, these are nonprofit organizations. You know, they're, they're, they're these universities. I mean, come on. And you know what? And I like I've probably said enough, but I just, you know, I, I just, it, it's hard for me. I had the most wonderful experience. You know, in, in our day, you know, what we did is we got our, you know, we, we got through school and summer came around and, you know, we got a job and I'd work for Howard Wright Construction as a laborer on one of their sites. And, you know, I'd go out and work for six weeks and make, you know, a couple grand, two or three grand. And, you know, I get my 200 bucks a month from the school to live on. And, you know, you're living on four or five grand. And it was, you know, and it, it was great. But you worked for it. You learned from that experience of getting a job and, and learn, you learn from that. I mean, how does, it, how does somebody learn from transferring school to school every 15 minutes? I mean, it's just crazy. It's sad. But anyway, and the, and the money piece, I just, you know, I'm an old timer. 40 years ago, <laughs> you know, so, so I'm, you know, these are all new things to me and I gotta, I gotta remember that, but, 
you know, I just, I just think that it's, it's becoming so much, like I said, about the money. I mean, UCLA and USC, why are they going to, you know, the big, tw- big 12, big 10? And it's about money, you know, and it, you know, it, it doesn't need to be that. I, uh, last comment. I just wish there was some place out there, and I don't know if it's the school presidents, I don't know if it's the NCAA, I don't know if it's the ADs, I don't know if it's the league directors, but how about some leadership? How about somebody saying, you know, this, we got to fix this. Because if it doesn't get fixed, and I, I might be wrong, but if, if it doesn't get fixed, what does it turn into? And what happens to schools? You know, I mean, Washington State's always a competitor of ours, right? Oregon State's always competitive. But, you know, they're not in the big cities. And that's the beautiful thing about Washington State. It's not in a big city. It gives somebody a different kind of experience to go to, go to school. If you're going to school in the, in, the, in the, you know, the very rural area. In Oregon State, same deal. And the, the schools, you know, that's, that's the beautiful part about the ki- different kids having different opportunities to do, for, do different things. So I just wish that, and, you know, somebody would take leadership, wrap hold this thing, fix the problem. And I, and I think that, you know, I'm a capitalist. I work in a business that's very, you know, very money driven. Um, but I, I just think the money aspect of, of, of a nonprofit organization and all these nonprofit organizations doing what they're doing is, is just wrong, not the right thing for the sport. I don't think it's the right thing for kids. And those kids need to develop not just their football skills, because the 90 percent of them, ninety five percent of them, they're not going to go off in the pros to make money. They're going to go get a job, get you know, finish their school and get a job, you know. And that's that's the reality. And so, you know, how about developing those skills? And I don't know if if it's just with the focus on this whole thing being what it is today, is it, it, it's it's not healthy in my opinion. But enough of that. Joe, thanks for sharing a lot of your thoughts. I was going to be asking you a bunch of questions on these subject matters, but you got them in college pay and a lot of, a lot of these issues. I can tell you're not a big fan of, of uh, college players being paid. I want to share some with you, Joe. Bear Bryant, when he coached at Alabama, had a rule that he would never get paid more than the University of Alabama, Alabama president. It's sure change, hasn't it? Yeah, it, it has. And you know, one interesting comment that John James, in his process when he was younger, you know, he asked. He was asked about, well, should we have a national championship? He says, he said, he said no. Well, should we have playoffs? He said no. And the reason why he said no is he said, you know, first of all, these kids aren't meant to go play 14, 15, 16 games a year, and they can't be playing into January. You know, this this bowl deal is beautiful. What's wrong with it? Yeah, you match up a couple of the better teams, and and you know, everybody plays a game and they win, and you, you know, basically vote on who. You know, who wins the national championship? What's wrong with that? You know, but this thing that, you know, it's so, it's all about money. It's just, it's just money. You know, it's all about money. And it's really unfortunate that, and he said that he thinks that, you know, going the direction of a national championship and a playoff will be very detrimental to the sport. And he says, I'm not in favor of, of that. And I love the bowl process. Well, all that stuff's going to change here. So. We'll see. Kim Jack just put on Facebook that Joe is speaking the truth. So um, our mutual friend, Kim Jack. Um, Joe, you know, I, I want to, I want something that's always, I had a guest on my show, a sports economist a couple of years ago named Andrew Zimbalis, a professor. He believes NCAA should be abolished and, and a whole new college system should be set up. Pretty radical proposal, but I've, I've had a lot of discussions on these issues with guests. And I do want to ask you something that, that has come up on my show. I had Ed Cunningham, my show, and your former Husky colleagues. I had this actually came up when I interviewed the famous attorney, Alan Dershowitz. Um, would you support, though, like a workers' compensation style system where injured college athletes could have some protections and benefits? Could you go along with something like that? You know, I could go along with a lot of things. I, I really could. I mean, first of all, it's been, like I said, I've been away from this so long, and I'm just such a, a a person on the outside looking in but to answer your question um on that issue i looked at my insurance policy is that school up there on campus and i go you know if i don't make it in you know college and i don't make it on the next level i had a pretty severe injury well what did i do i went finished my college education figured out you know what kind of business i might want to be in did my interview process 
that was my insurance policy, you know, to, to be able to figure out how I wanted to go live my life. Now, could they do that? And could they do it economically? And could they benefit some players? Yeah. But, you know, is, is that a good thing? Yeah, probably. Could I have used some bucks back in the old days? Yeah, but was that the driver for me? I wasn't even thinking about that. I was, you know, when I was done playing, it was okay. Finish your education. What do you want to do for a living? Go do it. You know, and here we are 40 years later. So anyway, but, but if that's a good solution, it's not, it's cost effective and it can go through the system and you're an attorney and you know a lot more than I do about it. But anyway, I just, I just think that, anyway, you know, the people I worry about the most in all of this, it's that it's a small sport people and what those programs turn into. And if there's so much of a money focus in the football and basketball worlds, what about the women's soccer, soccer players and the crew members and all those beautiful sports right. that are out there and those kids want to play in, you know, right. I mean, those are the kids that, you know, I mean, so that, that's, that's where a little concern is, but you know, your, your question about the insurance, it's cost effective. I mean, yeah. Yeah. A couple of our guests. Okay. We've talked a couple of our guests. Maybe get but, that but, but once again, I'll tell you something. That's the that's this group of people, these masters, the people, the presidents of universities that go back to Indianapolis where the NCAA is and put yourself in a conference rooms and sit down and have some conversation. And maybe they're doing that. But figure it out. Figure but it out. You're gonna have the S you're gonna you're gonna have the SEC and the Big Twelve, Big Ten, and the rest of them are all gonna be gone. And that's that's really sad because it you know and time is getting short, you know. But hopefully there's a fix to it, and we, we just haven't seen it yet. So appreciate your feedback, Joe. That particular proposal has come by show a couple of times. I wanted to hear your take uh, from a couple of different guests. Well, I encourage my listeners to subscribe, like, and comment. Go to sportsuntoldpodcast.com. I have um, the great uh, Joe Steele on right now. Joe, you know, you, you played for the, you were a preseason Seahawks player. You also played for a couple of Canadian football league teams and, and football injuries definitely affected your pro career substantially. I was reading a 2018 Seattle Times article before this interview. Joe, when you decide to hang up the cleats and move on from your football career, was there ever a point when you found it to be a struggle, maybe a year or 10 years later, because you miss football so much? Was it ever a struggle for you moving on from it? You know, um, I really enjoyed the game. I gr- enjoyed the experience at the University of Washington. You know, when I went into the pros, I mean, th- the injury that I had was pretty significant. I tore three ligaments. I tore my anterior cruci- cruciate ligament. I tore my posterior and I tore my lateral ligament. And, and they found my, you know, hamstring up, you know, up near my butt and had to bring it back down and tie it back down. So it was pretty significant, you know, the injury I had. Never, never felt comfortable about putting much weight on that leg and planting on that leg. Was 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 a was never the reckless abandoned player that I was prior to that injury. Um, clearly knew that when I was drafted by the Seahawks, I appreciated what the Seahawks did in drafting me in the fifth round. Um, I appreciate Jack Patera and bringing me over there and the Nordstrom family and the rest of them. I mean, I really, really do um, appreciate that. It took a little bit of a risk on me at the time, probably, you know, it'd be just because of the injury, but, but they brought me over and I went through the experience and it was, it was a, it was a wonderful experience to go through and to be part. It was really frustrating to really not be, you know, um, full hundred percent and going through that, uh, the Canadian thing was really interesting and fun for me. It was different. I, I didn't like the rules. When I got up there, I realized there's only three downs. It just didn't do much for me. <laughs> and I just, you know, I, I, I probably, sh- you know, whatever. But I, I just didn't enjoy it. I loved the experience. I was in Edmonton. Warren Moon was up at Edmonton. I was in Edmonton. And just to see a different culture, there, it was just so unique and different from the States and what football and college football is in the States versus what college football was up there. It's totally different. You know, these, they have 2,000 people at a football game. We have 60, 80, you know. And so, you know, so it was just a different influence. And you know, hockey is a big deal up there. So I spent some time, you know, a little bit of time in Edmonton, got hurt, had a high ankle sprain. They cut me, shipped me back to Montreal. 
was back in Montreal for 10 days, loved it. Beautiful city. Once again, a co- beautiful culture, saw something really cool. And then it, they were, season was starting. They had to cut me, so they cut me. And I came back to Seattle. I said, that's it. And uh, went back and jumped back in and get my last credits. And that was kind of my deal. Did I look back on it? I don't know. I just, I just tried to not let emo- the emotional side, you know, get to me, especially, I, 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 you know, there may have been a few moments in there where God, you know, but I, I was done, you know, and football, the beautiful thing about football, middle of football, you know, baseball, you go on forever. You know, basketball is now becoming, you go on for a while. If you're one of those bubble people, football, you're either in or out, right? you know, which is really good because it's good, if, you know, in a way, because if you're in or out, you can move on and you can get a career because those baseball players are showing up after 10 years in the minor leagues. I mean, you know, and, and they're 32 years old and, you know, they're, they're, you know, starting your career at that point is a little bit more challenging. So anyway, I, I don't, I don't try to waste my time on those, those points in time where they could be negative because you got to, you got to, figure out how to get through life you gotta pick it yeah. up and move on. yeah yeah we've all had some setbacks you gotta so take... to deal with them right 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 so yeah. these are two questions i've asked every guest since late 2019 i love the answers i get to these two questions i've asked some of your friends and colleagues these two questions the first question is who's a living sports figure can be an owner a general manager a player somebody in the sports world announcer you love to interview or chat with and who's a deceased sports figure in history you would have loved to have interviewed or spent some time with? Um, you know, Roger Staubach, to me, is an interesting story in that, you know, Roger went to the Naval Academy. And when he was done with the Naval Academy, I think he went and spent a little time in the Navy. Right. And then, you know, and then he shows up with the Dallas Cowboys and has a wonderful career there. And then, and then, you know, I'm in the real estate business. Roger had a career and a company and a tremendous program that he built in real estate. So just from a respect level of somebody that's currently living to, to hear that story that, you know, that I just said there, I mean, that's unbelievable. Right. You know, so, so the, Roger would probably be the one person that, you know, that I look at and go, man, who's, who's, who's the cat's pajamas? Who's the, the, the cream of the crop? Who's the, pl- who's the one person? I mean, yeah, you got the Michael Jordans and you got some of those others, but that's, you know, and what he, you know, once, once again, what he did in, in the Navy, what he did, what he once he did, you know, on the field, then once he did in the business world, it's, I mean, it's, a, it's an incredible story. No doubt. So second, secondly, you know, I grew up as a kid and I love sports. I loved, you know, a lot of different sports. When, like I said, when we were kids, we used to play a lot of basketball and we played baseball and some of those sports. But, you know, I, I, when I look at success and you want to, you know, if I was going to want to go interview somebody or be around somebody, it'd be somebody that, that really was successful. But John Wooden, you know, when I was a little kid, and he was going through that process that he went through, and that was that was that was unbelievable. I mean, for him to do what he did at UCLA and consistently, you know, put the players on. It'd be one thing if he had you know a couple of great players like Little Cinder and a couple of the other guys he was around, but he did it through three or four cycles, you know, and the level of success that he had, and then the, the you know that Don James mentality type stuff, but, you know, he took it to another level, but I, I, I think that it'd be fascinating to sit, you know, you know, on the waterfront someday with John Wooden and on a park bench and sit down and talk to him and have a little conversation about, you know, his thoughts and ideas and, and just pick it. Cause he was, he was, he showed great success. And it was really cool. Really enjoyed that. Two wonderful names. Staubach's name came up. I love how you and you and Roger Staubach had that real estate connection. And I don't think any guests had mentioned John Wooden yet as a deceased sports figure they would love to have chatted with. Great name. And John Wooden, um, 
so much humility to the man. I had a wooden biographer on my show a couple of years ago. He was a real gentleman too. So yeah. two, two great names. Uh, do you like the Caleb? I may be mispronouncing his name. Uh, do you like the Caleb DeBoer hiring? You know, I, have, I haven't been around it much. Um, I, I like, I, I think he's, it sure sounds like he's got a lot of the skills you want as a coach. You know, it sure sounds like he's a great guy and he's a hard worker and he, you know, he's going to try to develop something there that's, you know, cool and special. I mean, there's a little bit of alignment to Don James in his early years, just because, you know, Don came out of Kent State. I know that he came out of even, you know, even smaller schools than that, but he sure did a nice job at Fresno State. I watched him play last year a few times. Uh, and he, you know, he damn near beat Oregon, Oregon last year. And, and uh, you know, so he, you can tell he's, and he's, I'm sure he's surrounded himself with some great people, but it's tough. You know, he's, he, he's, you know, it's tough. I packed well's tough and what he's got going there now and all the different aspects of the game, are, you know, are just so much, so difficult. So, but I really wish him well. I really hope that he's able to be, you know, to have that success. I really do. I really do. Joe, what, what, where would you like to see Washington end up? All the conference shifting around. We talked about USC, UCLA are leaving the, the Pac-12. But do, where would, what, would, what would be your uh, preferred conference? Would you like to see UW in a newly recreated Pac-12? Just, just take a minute, if you don't mind, and share where you would like to see Washington land in the 2020s. You know what I, I think that what I'd like to see is I would like to see um, four conferences be developed. Uh, that are geographical, and they're they're you know um, either one in the southeast would be great, one in the northeast would be great from population and school perspective, and I'd probably put the Big Ten in there, you know one in the west, maybe one in you know Midwest, um, and and it gets away from this SEC, you know it gets away from the Big Twelve or Big Ten, you know, and it becomes hey it's college football, and you know call it 64 teams and those are your teams and I you know and they're all at the same level and then you know what they all get the same amount of money you know and the thing is is that you know whatever that is I mean it's just the direction this is going it, it, my concern and once again I have no expertise in whatsoever in this but I, I just think that you you get everybody in a room and if you're in business you get everybody in a room and you sit down and say hey what are we trying to accomplish here you know, and the thing is, you go through it and you dialogue about it and you get good leadership and you basically come out with a good decision. These decisions that are going on right now, it is money driven. You know, and these schools, you know, let's go all go back to what these things are really all about. You know, it's about the kids. It's about the education. It's about all of that. And, you know, this stuff that we're talking about here and the money and, you know, it's just ridiculous. But anyway, that's just one man's opinion well you well, many people share opinion joe you've been so generous your time you might if i get uh, two more questions in absolutely that's your time um joe how has you, you alluded to this earlier how has your football background helped your commercial real estate career you, you alluded earlier but feel free to elaborate a little more you know um the the development of a person in that process of sports and who you're around and who you get as mentors and all those life lessons they they just apply you know they they really do and and um i i just think that for me personally that was such a great learning experience that i went through and seeing the people and meeting the people that i did at a lot of different levels, you know, from the coaches to the alumni to the players, uh, all those things. I'll tell you, I mean, the, the team team is a funny one, right? And some people say, "Well, it's a team." No, no, no. I'm talking about team. I'm talking about watching people's back. I'm talking about being there for other people. I'm talking about res being respectful of, of others. You know, those, those things, and, and to bring those into business, I mean, people will recognize really quick. You know what's really matters in life and what really is important. And as I, you know, in the age I am and where I am in my life, I mean, I'll tell you that that's what, how I apply it to my business. I mean, you know, the Don Jane talked about, you know, eliminating mistakes, you know, 
He had a scorecard for every game. How did you do on every play? You know, hey, apply that to business. You know, are you the best you can be? Are you doing the things you need to be doing to, to do that? So absolutely, it's it's a huge part of my experience in, in, in my athletic years that I think rolls over tremendously to my experience in, in business. It just 100 percent. Absolutely. So. I like how Don James taught everybody. You treat everybody decently. The person serving the food in the mess hall, you treat everybody kindly. That was that, that was a powerful thing that you said earlier, Joe. So. So, yeah. well, this is my probably my last question, and I'm going to end on a lighter note. What's your favorite sports movie? My favorite sports movie. Got a, I got a few for you here. Okay. I got a couple. I got to just okay. walk through this. Okay. There's one. Great one, Rudy. Yeah. Rudy. Yeah. That was a good one. Okay. That was a good one. Yeah, no doubt. Wonderful Hoosiers. Hoosiers. Great one. Yeah. Wonderful yep. movie. Yeah. Now, I, ha I have a son who was born in 1998 named Jake. He's 24 years old now. And I'm a grandfather, by the way. Just became a grandfather. Oh, <laughs> Not through Jake, but through my daughter, my daughter, who's uh, right. 32 years old. Both of them went to the University of Washington. But Jake was born in 98. This movie came out in 1997, 1998. It's called Space Jam. I have seen this movie at least a thousand times. From the time he was born to the time that he was beyond the, that, that was the deal. But my favorite movie of all time, sports movie, Speed Biscuit. Good one. The Good Biscuit. One. Good one. I like how you mentioned Space <laughs> so I just, Jam. Joe, I'm going to watch Space Jam. I don't think I've ever seen it. You just you just contributed to me wanting to see that movie. So I think I'm going to watch it. Uh, it's a, it's a great, it's a great one. But I love, one thing about Sea Biscuit that I loved is just it's about the underdog goes out and takes on the big boys and successful and, and a team of uh, of an owner and a trainer and a jockey and a horse and just the whole story is is really about you know that team thing we're talking about so which is great joe loved it thank you so much for your generosity and coming on love love to have a chance to chat with you and to meet you and always the best it's you and i stay in touch absolutely thanks paul take thanks, care joe enjoyed it very much okay bye-bye